And you may think, well, light's pretty simplistic, right? You just screw a little light bulb in, it has heat, and that heat causes this glowing. Uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. Matter of fact, it is one of the great areas of scientific research in our world today, trying to just understand this basic reality that we call light. Uh, there is what's been happening since about the 1970s, this whole study in cosmic microwave background. Anybody been studying that recently? Yeah, me too. Um, until this week. And uh, the reality is that the same kind of waves that produce light that you just saw on the screen, the light that we see color with is just a very narrow bandwidth, but this cosmic background of microwaves, which is really the same kind of waves, it's just our eyes don't perceive it as light, it's invisible to us, bays the entire universe constantly. It comes from all directions. It doesn't have a singular source like the sun that you can trace where it came from. It's just everywhere. And the scientists are kind of believing that this is the, the residue, the, the, what's left over from the Big Bang. And as I researched it this week, I thought, yeah, God said let there be light and bang. You know, just everywhere. Indescribable almost to us. And Anyway, I just want you to know that we're going to kind of spend some time in light today. And I want you to just begin to think through the things that we've talked about already, about God, I need to be able to see you clearly. And what kind of light do I need in my life? Is it just kind of physical light, or do I really need some spiritual light as well? I'm going to welcome you if you're new to Journey, or maybe just returning. Uh, you've been here in the past, but maybe it's been a while. We're really glad that you're here today. If you've missed the last few weeks, we're in a series on the Gospel of John. And if the day catches you, we encourage you to go to, there's a Facebook page, Journey Community Church has a Facebook page, and you can find all the series of sermons up to this point uh, for this Gospel, the Gospel of John series there. I encourage you just to kind of go through them and just ask this simple question that we've been asking out of John chapter 1, verse 14. We're going to read it again. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Jesus. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what we kind of been saying each week is Jesus came to reveal the Father to us, to give us a real glimpse of God. If you've ever wanted to know, what does God look like? Jesus came to answer that for you. And as we see Jesus, we see more of who God really is. So every time, every week, we've been looking at this story, we've been going, what does this tell us about God? And we're going to do that again today. Today is going to lead us uh, to a kind of a, a, a idea of, of light. And it was in the first chapter. And we're going to come back to it a little bit at the end. It says this, In him was life. Speaking of Jesus again, in was, him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Just one of those great truths about light. Light always wins over darkness. I don't know if you've thought about that in kind of the cosmic sense, the reality of our world, but also the reality in a spiritual sense. It's amazing how that one little green light on your cell phone, right, just telling you it's charging, keeps you awake at night, isn't it? It starts to illuminate the whole room, and pretty soon you're going, who left that on? Well, because light cannot be overcome by darkness, and there's a truth there spiritually as well. Well, we're going to tear into the story. We're in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, so uh, we're going to have the verses on the screen. If you have a cell phone, feel free. If you want to follow along on, in, your, in your screen because uh, there's no light up there for you to read, you can actually follow along on your cell phone if you like. Chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And he passed by, speaking of Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, his man or, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? It's a very interesting kind of, once again, note that kind of starts off our story and gives us lots of details behind the scenes. It's important, this being born blind. It's not just thrown in there. It's unique to this story and is important. First of all, before we get to the end, it's going to point out that this is a miracle, that there's, there's no escaping the miraculous nature of this event. This man has always been blind. There was something wrong at birth. Not he was sight and then he, something happened, but it, it kind of corrected itself. There's no possibility of kind of self-correction here. There's only one explanation at the end of this story, and this man was blind and now he sees. There was something wrong and now there's not. There's a miracle. The second part is it kind of leads us into this, why be, be, being born blind is important, is the whole eye nature that something was missing, and we're going to kind of run into it 
a part of creation in this moment, in this miracle. But also, it also allows the disciples to raise an important question. One that seems kind of awkward to us, probably when you read it through, you're thinking, what's wrong with these disciples? They, ask, they see a guy who's born blind, and they ask this crazy question, who sinned, his parents or himself? Like, we wouldn't think to do that. But the disciples did, because of the kind of culture and the, and the mentality of their day, they had this kind of view. This view was important that the judgment of God was immediate. It was now that good things happened to good people and bad things happened to bad people. Very simplistic view. You may still have kind of remnants of that, right? Something terrible happened to somebody. Oh, I wonder what they've been doing, you know? I don't know. Maybe we're kind of stretching it the other way. We never look at anybody's faults and go, I wonder how they got there. And we never kind of maybe look at, at the opposite direction. The reality of what the disciples believed, though, is rooted in this idea and that God was simple. He wasn't complex. God was very, very straightforward. And this is what Jesus is going to kind of be teaching us today that this kind of simple view of God, if I do things right, life's going to go great. If I don't do things right, life's not going to go great. Now, there's reasons why the disciples held this view. There's passages of Scripture, particularly in the book of Proverbs and even earlier passages of Scripture that definitely lean this direction that the results of sin is suffering. And that is still true today. The challenge in this story is, though, that Jesus is saying that it's not always true. There's not always that reality in this in the story now remember the story from last week when jesus met the guy at the pool the crippled man the lame man the the person who had been weakened jesus hints in that that you need to quit sinning or something worse is going to happen jesus hints that that guy was in his situation because of his own particular sin so here's the reality for us as we begin to look at this. We, we, we need to grab a hold of this truth that God is complex. He's not simple. He's not this kind of God that we just kind of take and put a coin in and pull down the arm on the slot machine, hold our hands down, and we always get the same answer. He's not like that. That's idol worship. Because the idol's not personal. It doesn't have will or sovereignty. And in this passage, in these two stories, particularly together, the, the one we did last week and this week, we see Jesus dealing with some things very similar, but dealing with them completely differently. Why? Because God is complex. Jesus doesn't deny here that sin is generally the cause of all suffering or disease. In other words, in a general sense, that is how it crept into humanity. If we find it, even in ourselves, we can go, you know, this is a result of what mankind has done. He doesn't deny that sometimes my suffering that I'm experiencing is my stuff, what I have done right now. But Jesus is also not denying that sometimes suffering has nothing to do with what I have done. It appears that the disciples had heard Jesus at the pool in chapter 5 where we were last week and the hint that he had given. And so they thought they understood Jesus. They believed that Jesus was saying this man suffered because of what he did. And that's exactly what Jesus said. So they believed that they had kind of understood who Jesus was. And all of a sudden Jesus challenges their very simple understanding of God, gives them a different option that is extremely complex. Here it is. He says that, that the work of God might be displayed. It's an interesting thought. Jesus says this in chapter 9, verse 3 and 5. Here's what he says. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you'd have been there, or if I had been there with Jesus at that moment, we'd have gone, what does he mean? I don't get hardly any of what he just said. That's what would be kind of gone, going on in our mind, because he, he'd have taken our world and flipped it all the way around. What do you mean that this is taking place, that God's work might be displayed in him? 
Maybe we have a simplistic view of God in which God is so good, so kind, so generous that he would never allow suffering for this purpose or this cause. Maybe we would want to kind of explain it away and leave it to one of the other areas that it's just sin generally that's in mankind or that this person did something that caused it, but not that God would allow it so that his work might be displayed in humanity. This man has suffered for a number of years, but he is about to experience faith. And not just experience faith, but even share it with others. And Jesus says, that's the reason why. Now, you need to kind of wrestle around with that view of God, because that's not a simple view of God. That's a God that's complex. It's a will. There's sovereignty there. There's something that acts beyond us and beyond our thinking. Jesus goes on to state that they, speaking of his disciples, that they, he and his disciples, need to continue to do the work before it gets dark. Once again, kind of a cryptic statement, but definitely relating to the moment that is about to come that Jesus is now revealing that there's going to be a dark moment. We're going to talk about it in a few weeks when we get close to the death and burial and resurrection. That's the dark moment. There's going to come a time when he's going to be in, in the, on the cross and there will be no moments like what's about to experience right here where there's going to be healing and miraculous salvation. And, and that's not going to happen in that moment. And, and now is the time to do the work of God. Now, the question is, what does that kind of refer to? Jesus says here that he is the light this is not the first time that Jesus has used this term in the Gospel of John. Matter of fact, he's used it several times. And here he particularly connects him being the light with doing the work of God, showing God's work to others. Just kind of a side, when Jesus talks about us being the light to the world, that's still what he's talking about, that we're showing the work of God to others. And in this moment where Jesus explains that he's the light, the complexity continues. Here's what he says in chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. You talk about complexity. There's an enormous amount of complexity in this verse of Scripture. First of all, let's admit that spitting on the ground and putting mud in somebody's eyes is a little bit weird. And not as only weird, it's kind of gross. Please do not do that to me. I am not looking for that. Nor was this guy. I'd, I'd imagine he's going, what was that? Oh, oh, what are you doing? I don't know. I don't know what his thought process was. But it asks the question, why would Jesus do this? It goes back to the, the guy being born blind. Why The text isn't absolute clear on this, at least hints this way. This man had something missing. It wasn't just that something wasn't quite working. There was something not there. And Jesus had to do a recreation moment. What was man created out of? The dust of the earth. Hmm, interesting. What we have is this very, this very visible symbol of a recreation moment. And Jesus revealing the nature of the Father to us. He is that creator. He is the one that's responsible for my vision my eyes and your eyes. He's responsible for narrowing our ability to see this very narrow bandwidth between red and purple. And, and choosing not to let us see further on that scale that would allow us to see microwaves or UV rays or gamma rays or all the rest of the waves that are still the same waves, but he narrowed it so we could just see in this little bitty spectrum. And we see blue and red. But this guy didn't see anything of like that, and, and God recreates that in that moment. But the complexity of Jesus continues. Unlike the last story where Jesus heals the guy with no work on the other guy's part. Remember the story last week? He just healed him. Get up, go. 
Here Jesus says, now here's what I want you to do, blind man. I want you to find your way to this pool that's across Jerusalem. And I want you to find your way there. And then I want you to wash in this pool. He doesn't even tell him that he's going to heal him. <laughs> you think God is complex? For that guy in that moment, I believe there's an enormous amount of complexity. Why are you spitting in my face? What are you doing? You want me to go where? There are three good pools between here and there. Why not the first one? I mean, there's all kind of things that could have been raised in his mind. The Bible doesn't say any of those things happen. But all of them are real possibilities. This we do know. Jesus asked him to get up and leave where he is and go without knowing the result. Which I remind you from last week is completely different than the miracle of last week. Why? Because Jesus is complex. It's different. Here, he requires obedience before there's the miracle. Last week, there was a miracle and a hope of obedience. Here's the challenge for you and I. God still deals with us in a similar manner. You hear something that happens in another person's life, you go, man, God, that's what, wow, I'm going to pray that happens for me, and it doesn't. And then we go, God must not love me the same way over there. No, God's just complex. There's a reason why. Well, the reality is this man begins to see. He, he comes back. The Bible says he comes back seeing. Isn't that a great way to put it? When did he actually start seeing? Well, probably after he washed in the pool. Can you imagine that moment where he went, that's what blue looks like. I've never seen it before. Well, he comes back. The story gets even more complex. Here's kind of the response. We're going to read these kind of quickly just to see what's happening in this guy's life. Because this guy begins to move in faith in a very unique way, I think in a way that actually kind of connects with us a lot. So he comes back. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar, the ones who had been giving him money his entire life, going, yeah, you know what, we want to take care of you because we know you can't take care of yourself. That group of people were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? <laughs> you can imagine some of the questions that are being raised there. Huh, was he faking it? I don't think so. Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but it look, he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to them, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes and said to me, go, and, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? I don't know. Why doesn't he know? Jesus, he wouldn't know who Jesus was if he saw him, right? He's never seen him before. He doesn't know what he looks like. It's a great story. He begins to kind of work through faith. I want you to think about this story and how it relates to people. And I remind you that the kind of the theme that we've been going through for a few weeks is Jesus meets people exactly where they need to be met. This guy begins to talk about what G has happened. And the more he talks, the more he kind of thinks it through. How many of you like to think out loud? That's what this guy is. He's an out loud thinker. He begins to think it through. What took place for him? The reality is, it begins to make light for him. Not just physical light, but spiritual light. But it doesn't do that for everyone. Not for all of these people, and surely not for the group that's coming next. All he knows at this point is the man named Jesus. That's all he knows. Let's see where he goes. Chapter 9, uh, 13 through 17. The group didn't know what to do with him. <laughs> so what better to do? Let's turn him over to the Pharisees. That's exactly what happened in our story last week, that Jesus got turned over to the Pharisees. So they're going to turn this guy over to the Pharisees. So they brought the... So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud in my eyes and I washed and I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes, he said, He is a prophet. I want you guys to think through all that's going on. In this group, you see really the two kind of groups of mankind. You see the people who have already determined, uh, no, I don't care what he does, I'm not going to believe in him because he has crossed some barrier in my life that makes him wrong. For them, he had crossed the Sabbath regulations. So they had predetermined in their mind that this is the way that, that God must interact with me. And if he doesn't interact this way, then he's not God. It's not from God. And they excuse or they dismiss Jesus. The other group is very confused. They're not sure. But they see things and they begin to go, I don't understand, but it must be from God. There's really two groups in the world. Every scientist, every philosopher, every person sitting in this room is in that one of those two camps. I've already predetermined that God is not real and none of the evidence, no matter how strong it is or how much I see it, is going to change my mind. Or that group of people are going, I don't get it, I don't understand, but it sure seems like God. This man began to accept this truth that what happened to him was a miracle. He began to realize he couldn't rationalize it away no matter what he heard around him. He kept saying in his mind, I was blind and now I see. I was blind and now I see. There's only one explanation. Only God can do things like that. I wonder in your life, whether you're a Christ follower or not, whether you're a Christian or not, claim to be, if you have something in your life where you're going, you know, I have no explanation for that. I don't know how that happened. For me, I have a couple that have to do with driving. I just go, I have no idea how I avoided that collision. It just seems like a God thing because I should have hit several things there. How did that happen? And maybe you have something like that, just like this guy, that it's hard for you to understand what happened. It sure seems like a miracle. Well, this guy begins to go, it was a miracle. I don't get it. And the only label that he could throw on it, that he must be a prophet, because prophets were the ones who did the miraculous things in the Old Testament from God. If a miracle took place, it was a prophet who did it. He was kind of God's intermediary. So he has moved from this first step of faith, well, his name's Jesus, okay, to he's from God. Where does it end up? Well, the story goes on. The, uh, the Pharisees are not satisfied, so they, they question his parents. If you read the next section, they bring his parents in and question them, and, and uh, they're scared to death that they're going to get thrown out of this, the, the, the synagogue. So they just say, hey, look, you, you talk to our, our son. We don't know. And so uh, they kind of <laughs> bail on him just like the guy did on Jesus last week, and they turn him back over. So they, they re-question the same guy again, chapter 9, verse 24, one of my favorite stories, because I just love the humor in this story with this guy, between this guy and, and the Pharisees. As he's growing in faith and confidence, here's what it is. So for the second time, they, speaking of the, the leaders, the Pharisees, called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man, speaking of Jesus, is a sinner. In other words, you need to honor God and quit honoring this man. He answered, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why, do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we don't even know where he comes from. Probably an allusion to his birth, uh, that we're not quite sure who his dad is. The man answered, Why is this an amazing thing? Do you not know where he comes from? And yet he opened my eyes. You see, kind of he, the, 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 the wisdom's coming to him. The, the light is kind of shining in his eyes mind. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that 
anyone open the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. So they, they revert back to the question of the disciples. Does this, was it this man or his parents that sinned? And they've made the decision, both of you, <laughs> you and your parents were sinful. You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us. And they cast him out, speaking. And they threw him out of synagogue. They threw him out of society. It's a great passage of Scripture. Uh, there, it's fun, right? I actually think the, the gospel writer probably had fun writing this one. Here's this guy that's gaining spiritual light. And as he does, he's becoming more and more confident. And the only thing those that are refusing light can do is ask the same repetitive, redundant, going nowhere, no solution questions. They just want an argument. They don't really want to deal with the answer and say, we don't know. We can't figure this out. It seems that he's, you know, we don't think he's from God because he's breaking the Sabbath, but he's doing things from God. We don't know the answer. So what do they do? They just want to have an argument. This guy will moves to faith instead it's an interesting thing that he gets thrown out of the synagogue and i just kind of a quick aside here off to the side something we're going to bring up in the next few weeks one of the things that kind of struck me about this moment in this this story is jesus doesn't seem to be overwhelmed by the fact that he's going to be thrown out of synagogue and this was a big deal i mean when we're talking about thrown out of society he may not have he may have struggled to make a living uh more or less you know being accepted in the right society it, it was serious and yet jesus wasn't concerned because jesus knew this truth jesus knew that he was establishing a new society a new family that this man was going to belong to called the family of god or his family and that, that family was going to take care of him that he was going to be one of his followers we call this thing the church now uh, jesus called it that later on and and that society is where he was going to find his culture his life his acceptance we're going we're gonna to share more on that in the, in the weeks coming. I just kind of throw that to you and you begin to think about what that meant for this man. Well, interesting, Jesus meets the guy. Jesus hears that he's been thrown out of synagogue. Chapter 9, verse 35 and through 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, thrown him out of synagogue. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? that I may believe in him. It's an interesting thing. This man is in a, in a position now, a desirous position. He wants to believe. He's moved away from the skepticism. He's come to grapple that God has done work in his life, and now he wants to believe. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Isn't that a great passage? Jesus finds this guy. Jesus is ready to reveal himself, not just as a prophet, not just as, as, one, as one of the many kind of ways in which uh, God has worked through mankind, but as this term, the Son of Man, a very complex term in the Gospel of John, particularly Jesus has already referred to himself as the Son of Man on several occasions, the man which has come to bring judgment. And that's where this passage is going to go in just a second. That's going to stand in, in the one who judges all humanity. But it also had kind of the, the understanding of that he was the Messiah. He was the everything this man had hoped for and dreamed of. That's who Jesus was going to be. This one who is revealing the nature of the Father. I want you to just think that through. Jesus said, I'm, I'm that one. You want to know what God is like. When you see me, that's who you see. And the reality is at this moment, contrary to all the pressure that had come from all the sides around him, all the religious leaders of his day, all his family maybe that had kind of abandoned him to the Pharisees, against all of that, he goes, I believe. He had seen the work of God in his life, and he wanted to believe in Jesus. Well, that kind of leads us to a, a couple questions about spiritual light. 
as complex as natural light is, and if you don't know how complex that is, I just challenge you to spend a few minutes reading this week on just photons. You're thinking, are you serious? I am, actually, because I think it will actually take you to a spot where you go, man, God is a great creator. And then that can transfer, as it did for me, to going, wow, I serve a great God. And what it reveals about God, not just in the kind of the physical universe, but in the spiritual universe for me, is the complexity of our Heavenly Father. And here's the reality. Jesus understood exactly what this man needed. He understood that this man needed a miracle, but he also understood that he needed time to talk it through and work it through. And he brought about all this stuff in this moment to challenge his faith so that he could bring him to deep faith. We wrestle around with the idea that this man had suffered blindness for a number of years. All for this moment where he could believe. But truly, the greatest thing that ever happened in his life was this moment where he says, I believe and he worshipped. It was worth all that other suffering that he had endured. The reality for God is that God is complex and he refuses to fit his, who he is in our limited understanding. So if you have a a very narrow view of God, that God has to interact with me in a certain way, and He will always do this for me when I do this, I'm going to challenge you that God's going to kind of break that apart. Somewhere in your life, God's going to challenge that. Now, we know that there are several truths, or there are truths in Scripture that are unchanging, that ultimately all things will be rewarded that are good, all things will be punished that are evil. But Jesus also says that he allows rain on the just and the unjust. Suffering happens to both. Jesus interacted with people uniquely exactly what they needed. The reality for you is still the same. God knows exactly what you need and how to interact with you. And the time that you need and what you... What you need to bring you to deep faith or to continue growing your faith. And you're thinking, I don't know why I'm going through this at this moment. Well, I can promise you that it's, it's not needless suffering. That God can and will redeem suffering for our good, just as he did this man. The Father is a person of will and choice. Discernment of each and every humanity's exact need. He is working especially for you. And whatever is in your life right now, He is using that to deal with things for you. God interacts with you in the best possible way for you. I do not believe in coincidence. I don't believe it's a coincidence you're here or that I'm here. I believe this is part of God's complexity, working our lives together so that we may grow in faith with Him. This complexity of God will never allow you to control Him. When you believe, I've got God figured out, (laughs) you need to get ready because life's about to shake down for you. Because God doesn't want you there. And here's the truth, you don't really want to be there. Do you really want to serve a God that you can figure out, you can control, you can manipulate, you can be the one who's really in charge ultimately? I don't. I want a God who has an answer to these things. The problems of life that I go, I don't know. I read one site this week. What would happen if the sun quit shining? I don't want to know the answer to that. Not an experience. I, uh, from what that guy said, within an hour, I'm done. Frozen. That doesn't sound fun. I want a God who knows the answer to when that sun quits shining and what happens next. All of this points to a relationship with God. I want you to think about the person who's closest to you, whether it's a a spouse, a, a friend, a child, whoever is your closest connection. Admit to me that they are complex. I'm married. My wife is complex, wonderfully complex, but complex. But so am I. Why? Because there's will. I change. She thinks she's figured me out, and then I just change on her. 
change my mind, I change my thoughts, I go in a different direction, I grow. That's the nature of relationships, and God is that way with you. I want you to understand, God is inviting you into a relationship with Him, but it's a relationship with a complex being. The next truth that we kind of come through with all this kind of conversation today, back to this idea that light overcomes darkness. The good news that although in our world today it appears that darkness is winning. I don't know if you've had that feeling, but it sure feels like that to me sometimes that darkness is kind of creeping in. And more and more morally, family is just kind of disintegrating around us. Here is a truth. Light always wins. God's light, His eternal light, spiritual light will always win out in the end. I want you to just kind of hold on to that, grab a hold of that for your future, and think that through no matter what it looks like around me. The light of Christ will win in the end. And that leads us with kind of the last thing about light, the kind of unique thing about cosmology. Although we need light desperately to survive, light is external to every human being. We don't create it. We, can, we have to actually have it given to us, right? We don't have the ability to go, oh, you know what? I think I'll just turn on my light bulb in my head and light shines out of our eyes or something. It doesn't work that way. Do we, we have flashlights or we, we have to have something that we burn. or we, we, Somehow light is given to us, not something that we produce. This also connects with us spiritually because Unfortunately for many of us, we believe that we actually can kind of figure it out spiritually on our own. Matter of fact, the kind of modern idea is I will create spiritual light on my own. I'll make it the way I want it to be. This is what heaven looks like for me. What does it look like for you? As if somehow that alters what eternity looks like. Two human beings that can't create a match, a light of a match on their own, somehow are going to discern spiritual truth of the universe. A little bit hard, isn't it, to believe that when you think it through? Spiritual light comes to us. That's the reason why Jesus came. The last passage of Scripture we're going to read today, John chapter 9, verse uh, 39 through 40. The very last part of this. The Pharisees had overheard Jesus speaking to the, the man that he had just healed and was talking to, and so they kind of respond back to him. Jesus said, for judgment I came in this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Here's the point of what Jesus is trying to say basically is this. You need to recognize your need for God's light. They were saying, no, we've got it figured out. <laughs> Here was the light of Christ right next to them, and they couldn't see it. That's how blind they were. The greatest struggle for us human beings is really to understand the level in which we do not see clearly God. We catch little glimpses, or we think we may see something, and then it's kind of a blur. It's very easy for us to be deceived by our enemy who wants to make him different than he is, soften him down to where he's just kind of a teddy bear. God's complex. He's not a slot machine that we just put in the right coin and get the right answer that we want. He's a person. And yet, as the songs that we've sung about all day long up to this point, is really he is a loving God that has come for us that we might have his light. I want you to ask you this question. Do you need help from God understanding this, this complexity? Who doesn't bend to your will, but is encouraging you to bend to His will in obedience? This morning, if that's kind of where you are, no matter whether it's maybe that first step with Christ or way on down the line, just something that God's dealing with you, we want to pray that you'd be able to experience that today. The worship team's going to sing this song about worship about how great God is. And I want you just to kind of let that sink in, that we're serving a great God, that I can actually trust to lead me the right direction. I want to surrender to Him.
just like this guy did. Who is he that I may believe? That we'd have a heart ready to believe in Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, God, this story is really impactful, God, into where we are in our world today. Just this belief that we can kind of create our own spiritual light, whatever we want it to be. And God, it's, it's just a, a, a belief built on irrationality. God, if you exist, we need you to reveal yourself to us, and we believe you do. So God, even in this moment, God, today, we're asking that you would just help us to see you. For some, maybe it's to really understand your complexity, that we cannot control you. We can't manipulate you around to what we want. That over and over again, just like this guy, you want us to just be obedient and go wash. Take a step of faith and just believe and be obedient. For some today, God, it may just be trying to understand your love for them. Suffering for many years through different things, God, it has become a, a belief that you don't care and that you're, you're far and distant. I just pray today, God, even now that individuals who feel that way, God, would experience you close and they would come to understand that you do love them just like this guy did. God, we pray for your grace today. We believe that you are a great God. Amen. Thank you.